Welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series. And I'm really glad to have Darlene Lim here from NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, she's a colleague. We go back a while. Darlene has done all sorts of incredible stuff in um, exploring the Earth to prepare for the exploration of the Moon and Mars. Uh, she's a geobiologist and an exobiologist. Uh, she's been to some of the world's most extreme environments. And what I thought today we'd do is talk to her about um, about human Mars exploration and what she's been doing in preparation for humans traveling to Mars. So, Darlene, thanks a lot for joining me. It's um, my pleasure. I thought I'd uh, <laughs> ask you first, um, will humans go to Mars? Do you think this is going to happen? We keep, you know, we, we, we're always told it's going to happen in 10 years' time. Right. Um, are we there? Yeah, I'm excited to say that I'm very optimistic. Um, I, what's the best way to put it? I mean, I want to say yes. Like, when I just say yes, I'm going to say yes. Yes. Yes, humans are going to go to Mars. But, you know, the thing that I don't want to convey is that it's uh, yes, and it'll just happen. And I'm wishfully thinking that. No, I, I, I put a lot of thought into this. And and um, a lot of people are putting a lot of thought into this. And so that's what gives me the capacity to say yes. And I'm a pretty conservative human being. Um, and the other exciting thing to me at this moment in time is that we have a confluence of sort of political will in some ways. Um, you know, this industry that, that has built up around pretty innovative um, launch systems, which will con continue to innovate. We've got the will of private citizens like Elon Musk and others who want to see this happen, which is a pretty neato thing that's happened in the last few decades, which I think differentiates this moment in time from other moments in time where I've been asked this question. And then we've got this critical mass of of work that's been building up, I think, over the last five decades around human exploration of extreme environments. Um, and the strategies that are coming online to, um, you know, go back to the moon and then extend our presence there, understand the moon and understand it with the perspective of also then building on that knowledge to send humans there and have them stay there for long periods of time is a wonderful opportunity to then be much um, more si safe and sound in saying, yes, yes, mm -hmm. humans are gonna go to Mars. So that's that's why I would say that. Now we're okay. in we're in a in a moment of pause in many ways, of course, on so many different research elements. So, you know, we have to take that into account as well. And once we get there, so hopefully this happens. And, and as you say, you've got these private companies now that are coming online. There seems to be a lot more critical mass for, for going to Mars. Once we get human beings there, what will they do on Mars? Some people might wonder, you know, OK, we, we land humans on Mars. What are they going to do there? Is it going to be science, tourism? What, what do you see the future on Mars being? Um, so my future, the, the vision that I have of the future is pretty myopic in many ways because I've been focused on the real practical element and the first few landed missions on Mars. Um, so I see the the first, let's say, let's just take the first landed mission on Mars as an opportunity to move from a survival mode to a thriving mode. So survive to thrive and say the first 450 days on the surface of, of Mars. A lot of that work will be ensuring that the systems that we sent in advance of those human missions are are um, still working nominally. Of course, we'll have to check on that even before the humans land. We'll have to set up um, our environment so that it supports the humans to be able to do more and more complicated tasks over long that longevity of that long period of 450 days. And then also allows a foundation to be built, um, I think operationally and in architecturally for subsequent missions so that we can have humans extend the presence on the surface of Mars. So there are some very practical kind of first level uh, establishment tasks that will have to get done, but optimistically within those first 450 days as an example, we'll be able to move into more of an ex exploration phase where the scientists, where the, the where the humans on the surface of Mars can act as scientists, can be the scientists that we hope they can be to answer some really interesting questions around, um, you know, the possibility of life on Mars, um, preservation of life, those types of things, and just generally exploring it for, say, very applied um, or basic research questions. Because mm. there is always this concern, isn't there, that you go to Mars, you plant a flag, and you come back, mm -hmm. and although the Apollo program was very successful. Um, we don't really want to do that on Mars, right? We really want people to be staying there for a while so it doesn't just all 
fizzle out at some point, but there's some mm -hmm. long-term presence there. Yeah, to I completely agree with you. And I, so that's why um, I think that the, um, for me, the immediacy is of trying to understand those first few land admissions and everything that has to go into it and reaching out, you know, enabling us to galvanize more than just the research community around this problem solving um, of the first 450 days and just reaching out to industry and other um, sorts of partners to answer that question will mm. be super important because whatever we do at the beginning will really set the tone for, for I think, the future in, many, yeah. you know, in any different way you can imagine. So, so in a moment, I want to talk about what, what you do, because you've done a huge amount um, to advance this, this objective of getting to Mars. Before we get to that, um, uh, what I'd really like to know is what, what inspired you to get into space exploration? I mean, in, in your earliest years when you were young, when did you get, start getting interested in space exploration? Okay, well, I'm totally going to make you blush, but like people like you were very instrumental in getting me into this. <laughs> I'm not going to take any credit. Now, <laughs> um, well, you should, because I'll tell you what, when I was young, um, the one thing I did was just want to explore. And I was very, I grew up somewhere pretty cold um, that in Canada, you know, that, that spent a good portion of its, the, the year was uh, in darkness, really, because our winters were long. Um, so Northern Canada, but what I got to do um, is be outside whenever I could and just explore um, in my neighborhood and then, you know, largely in my local area. And then uh, the other thing I did a lot of as a kid was watch TV, which I know is like, you know, not really something cool that I should say right now. But happily, there were good TV shows on like Jacques Cousteau. Those were really instrumental and in just inspiring me and keeping that um, curiosity relevant in my life for many years to come. It's all sorts of things that I could cite, but really it was in, um, I went into graduate school. I actually worked before I went into graduate school. I worked in something completely different, um, a completely different field. And then while I was in graduate school and working on earth sciences projects up in the Arctic, um, that's where I got the chance to meet people like yourself, people like Chris McKay, Pascal Lee, others who were doing um, analog research with an eye to sending humans to Mars. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then the happy thing was that the exchange was really bi-directional, you know, with you and with others. And that it was like, oh, and hey, Darlene, you know, that stuff that you're doing on lakes, that's actually mm -hmm. relevant to some of our interests when it comes to exploring Mars in general, or or even just how you can help around extrapolating your knowledge of field work to eventually settling uh, humans on Mars. That um, gave me a pathway to really onboard a lot of my broad interests when it came to science, exploration, operations, logistics, like so many things that it's sort of been bubbling in me over the years. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, yeah, again, I'm totally going to make you blush, but like that, that, those types of conversations at that stage in my life, very instrumental to where I am today. It's amazing, actually, because it seems to be a common thing that a lot of people get started by things they see in popular culture, and then it sort of um, mutates into a sort of professional interest as they get older but it is amazing the number of uh people who seem to have read things or seen things when they were much younger i, I mean r remember reading hg Wells as war of the worlds and of course although those aliens aren't on mars just this idea of things coming from mars i remember interested me in in the planet mars and what might really be there and but you obviously you know developed this professional interest as you say you went and uh started looking at Canadian lakes, and I think you were working on diatoms, weren't you, during your PhD? That's right, yeah. And how did that sort of um, translate then into, into Mars exploration? Because one of your first projects, right, to really advance human exploration of Mars was the Pavilion Lake Project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll jump around a bit. Of course, I'm compressing a whole bunch of events, but like eventually yeah. after finishing my PhD in Canada, um, I managed to secure a postdoc with Chris McKay at, at NASA Ames. And the project that Chris wanted me to work on uh, was to do with the lakes. It was an astrobiology focused project in understanding the structures called microbialites, which are rocks built by microbes that were growing in um, this lake in Canada. So ironically, I went to the States to come back to Canada as my first project. But um, there were lots of questions around what was really the dominant mechanism allowing these um, structures to form and to form to a pretty large you know, size in the end. Like some of them were two meters in height and, and larger in girth. Um, so 
when I first visit, visit, visited, pardon me, the lake, the plan was for me to just look at it from a kind of physiochemical or limnological perspective, you know, understand the chemistry of the lake, um, some of the physical processes that were undergoing, that were, were, that were underway, um, and how those involved the microbes, what types of microbes were there and so forth. But when we went to the lake, it, it just seemed like, geez, there's such an opportunity here to do more than just that. And I'm at NASA, which is such an incredible opportunity. Again, I came from Canada, I immigrated, you know, to the United States with all of these different possibilities ahead of me. And so the 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 quiet thought that went on in my head, which, you know, actually I'm being very open with you now for kind of the first time was, I can't squander this. Like I've got to take advantage of mm -hmm. everything that is in front of me and see what I can really squeeze out of it. So yeah. happily, you know, I met all these incredible people along the way that wanted to be a part of that. And I think it just fed this amazing hunger that people had to 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 look at a problem to definitely look at it from the science perspective, but then to say like, what more? How could we take what we're learning here underwater, which is a very hard place to work, which is, it's not cliche, it is a wonderful analog to working in space for so many different reasons. Um, and how can we take that and learn from that about human exploration? And the lake ended up being useful, whether we were looking at the moon and exploring an asteroid or exploring Mars. So that was a really wonderful start. And, and you really did that, didn't you? Because a lot of people do stick just to the science of things. Um, and obviously that's a, a useful contribution, but you really have got involved in the operation side of things, the development of technology. And I guess, um, I don't know whether you would agree with this, but it seems that um, a lot of this sort of became fully fledged in, in your recent project, Basalt, which was to not just do science in preparation for Mars exploration, but develop the technology, the operations problems of of doing science and existing on a planet so far away. How did, how did that come about and what have you learned from basalt? Um, yeah, basalt, it was certainly a labor of love um, it, and it really was a culmination, as you said, of actually many different things. I don't want to, it wasn't my project, I just happened to be the lucky soul who got to be the PI, but it mm -hmm. belonged to so many people contributing over many years and um, it, it was sort of an evolution of Pavilion Lake in many different ways. And as well as after Pavilion, we also um, applied the knowledge we learned at the lake to places like Nemo, which is another analog, to Desert Rats, um, to smaller um, analogs, and then eventually to Basalt. And Basalt was a science-driven um, analog mission, again, like you said, to also examine the um, the problem set of conducting analog or science scientific research in the field as a way to learn about how to do that off planet. And um, so the, the science really had to be uh, the, the, the forcing function to make sure that anything that we did around the science, um, that we simulated around the science would be in service of science. So it brought together a lot of the kind of usual suspects that I had been working with over the years and then grew the team further um, into other areas. And of course, brought people like yourself um, onto the project and, in, in, you know, and we got to work together again, which is amazing because of the astrobiology focus. And we were working in uh, vol volcanic settings because they were deemed as excellent analogs to certain conditions on the planet of Mars. And we were trying to understand, you know, how the different uh, contexts of those volcanoes affected the microbiology overall. And um, that was awesome. But then, of course, we had to conduct our field work, not with just taking the science team and plunking them down and allowing them to walk around like we would normally, but under simulated Mars mission conditions. And um, so what we did is we put in place a system where we only had two people go out acting as astronauts conducting EVAs, extravehicular activities on the surface of Mars. And we had them go out in service again of answering science questions from your lab, from other labs and so forth. So all of the planning that had to go into every single EVA took months and months and months of discussion, arguing, you know, wrangling everybody around a problem and trying to get them to drop their obfuscations and any of their their, their predetermined, you know, assumptions about a problem and the way to solve it, and then just bring their expertise to the table and and then solve the problem in the best way forward. And so, so while that was pretty much. I'd say like 90% of the project was just having those conversations, testing and retesting until we got into the field and then could simulate these Mars missions and do so under these incredible time delays of five and, and 15 minutes one way. Um, 
Um, That's right, because the time delay is one of the major problems, right? If you particularly right. if you're going to be communicating with people on the Earth, you've got what is it, a sort of 20, 30 minute time delay, depending on the distance between Earth and Mars. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And uh, kind of the prevailing thinking in the literature and the community was that when an EVA was progressing and you had these long time delays between the Earth and Mars, you would sort of abdicate any um, input to the local ground control on, on the surface of Mars. And you would wait in a more strategic sense to provide input to that EVA. So we wanted to actually look directly at that problem set from an operational standpoint and find out if that was true. And the folks that did that led the research from the operations end um, set us up so that we could conditionally look at the problem um, from different time delay conditions, different um, uh, you know data rates, those types of things. And to cut to the the punchline, what what we found is that you can actually have meaningful science discourse back and forth from Mars to Earth and impact the science in a meaningful way while the EVA is happening. You just have to be really organized around that. So, mm. um, yeah, and, and I think we're just scratching the surface because... What is, what, Go ahead. Of, of all the challenges that you, you've come across in that project and you've integrated the science into the operations, what do you, what do you think will be the greatest challenge for people living and working on Mars? Lip, those that are working, living and working on Mars, um, you know, I think the challenges will be fundamentally ensuring that they are, uh, they're healthy, they're safe, they're sound and capable of doing their work, which um, will be difficult to do. They're going to be facing a lot of pressures to ensure so many different complicated um, systems are not just working, but interacting mm. appropriately. Um, I think there are probably a plethora of other kind of social as well as psychological elements that they'll be dealing with. But interestingly enough, I actually think a lot of the, um, or a lot more attention has to get paid on what happens on Earth as well, because it, there's, not, there's also a distance and, and a social distance and an intellectual distance that will build up between those two entities. And if we want to assume and plan for the fact that all of our or a lot of the scientific intellectual capital will, will remain on the earth, then we've got to take care of them too. And we've got to do that in a very bi-directional sense. So I, I mean, I think it's there's so much information, there's so much building momentum around trying to ensure that the crew is very safe on you mm. know, the journey to and from and while they get there. But we've also got to spend some time thinking about those that remain on earth. Yeah. Okay, and so I'm not, not going to draw you into politics here because I know this is a contentious issue, but people have arguments these days about, you know, whether we should be going to the moon first. So we've spoken about Mars. Um, some people say that the moon is a good place to test technologies before we go to Mars. Other people say, well, if we want to go to Mars, we should just go there and, and that should be the objective and just get on with it. Do you have any thoughts about this? Do you think there should be, there's a particularly good way of exploring the solar system? And uh, and doing scientific exploration, should we go to the moon first or straight to Mars? I think there are benefits to to taking any of the above, Charlie. I'm not going to be giving you a very satisfying like binary answer here. But you're going to give me a NASA political answer. No, no, I'm not. Actually, I'm going to give you a really personal answer, and I can tell you. Um, so here's the situation that I'm in right now. So I'm working on the Viper Lunar Rover mission, mm. um, which is a mission that's being sent to the moon in 2023 to explore the South Pole. And we're exploring it from the perspective of trying to understand the water uh, the water content within the regolith um, and with the broader perspective of trying to figure that out so that we can know what's there to support you know, future missions and, and human mm. missions. Um, but the way that the mission's gonna get run is really interesting in that we will have um, constant communications with this rover. We'll have information coming back to the Earth, um, but we will also be enabled, or and we'll also be enabled to make some decisions about where to go, um, uh, what to do next in real time, and then we'll kind of, you know, have these more strategic periods. So what's fascinating is that though, so you know, the work that we've been doing for say these these within these Mars analog missions has been focused on very long time delays. What we've learned operationally around how to manage decision making under what becomes a very compressed period of time to make different types of scientific decisions has bearing on trying to scope 
the way that we make decisions when we go to the moon, when we have a 1.3 second um, delay, which is actually fairly long, maybe not to to you or I in a in a moment where we're sitting and thinking about a decision on Earth, but certainly if there was a 1.3 second delay between when you talk to me right now and I answered, it would get irritating. Mm. Um, and operationally, that actually changes a lot of things. And and that's not a static number. It's going to vary. And um, and then we'll have, you know, it's going to vary actually potentially quite greatly. And then there are all these other holdups and hangups that just happen on Earth. So um, working this out for the moon, trying to organize ourselves for the moon, and even the actual act of what the rover is focused on for this mission, which is ISRU related, trying to map and understand the um, you know the, the water weight percent, the ground ice coverage within the moon. All that has direct relevance to what we will have to do absolutely on Mars. So I think yeah. every time we do something like this, um, so long as we, we understand you know the the overall highway that we're that we've kind of parameterized all this work within, which is go to the moon, get to Mars. Then there are going to be connections. We're going to learn every time we do something. So I'm. I'm really excited from that perspective about all these connecting dots. Yeah, th this is really exciting. And as you say, you know, learning on the moon, how to do things that will help on Mars. They're not really two separate locations. They're both connected in terms of developing all this science and technology. So hopefully all this will develop over the next decades. And um, there will be opportunities, of course, for new um, astrobiologists and planetary scientists to come in and be involved and push this plan forwards for the exploration of the moon and Mars. Given all the experience of you've had over your career, is there any sort of advice you would give to someone maybe who's listening to this, who has aspirations to work at NASA or work on eventually maybe on the moon themselves or perhaps go to Mars? What would you tell them to do in terms of their, their careers and their professional goals? Um, okay. So I'll, <laughs> thank you for that question. I'll just tell you what I try and do every every opportunity. If I'm in a leadership position, then mm -hmm. I try and work hard on being the best manager I can be. Right now, um, I am working in a position where I have to work within um, a group, a team, an immediate team, and then report up and out as well. And I want to make sure that I understand how to be the best employee. And I think that helps me as well be a better manager when I see, you know, how I'm potentially making my manager's life harder or mm. how uh, how there might be a lack of communication and and then ask myself, how, how might I make his life easier? So all these types of things I think are really important. It's not just about the science, like the one constant in everything. And another thing I was going to say around the connection between the moon and Mars is when it comes to human exploration, I mean, it's humans. Humans humans are humans are thinking of the mission. Humans are activating the missions. Humans are enabling the mission. And it's the same with science. Every day, we're, we're all we've got, right? We've got to keep communicating. We've got to keep understanding how to bring out the best in each other. And so hmm. it's a long story to say, I think spend some time thinking about how to manage and be managed and be the best contributor you can be on a team. It's very valuable, even if you have two people or if you've got 52 people or 2,000 people to learn mm -hmm. that skill. And then the second thing that um, I try and do every day, at, you know, since I was very young, is just manage anxiety. And I'm more and more open about this every day in that there are things that are put in front of me and I really do not know what I'm supposed to do. And that can be just like, you know, overwhelming in moments. And, um, but people put that trust into you. And so that's what keeps me going. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. And even if I don't know, eventually I'll figure my way through it. And I'll do so by maintaining lines of communication with my peers and with my managers. I will um, just admit that I don't know something. You know, those types of things, um, just trying to retain the humility in every moment, it, to me is very important. That's interesting because we tend to sort of get, as you rightly say, sort of focus very much on the scientific path. But it seems to me what you're saying is, you know, obviously it's important to have a good degree and to uh, understand the technical side of all of this if you want to get into human exploration or space exploration generally. But it's actually developing those human aspects that are that are very much um, sort of underpinning structure to being successful at doing the sorts of things that you've been doing with with NASA and in fact if anyone gets involved in this sort of work to to explore space yes and and I get asked the question you asked me a lot by students 
you know, mm. what should I be taking? And, yeah. and the thing is, like, I stopped saying, you know, make sure you focus on your STEM sides because of course they already are. And of course they're going to, they know that they have to do well at school and work, blah, blah, you know, work hard. They know that stuff, but I don't know if they know that actually it's okay to have some anxiety about the fact that you might be worried you can't do that job that somebody just put in front of you and that you have to be more forgiving of yourself and work through these issues. And actually at the end of the day, that is fundamentally what keeps you going and moving forward. And then meeting that um, statement of you are successful, whatever that is, whatever qualifies that, um, moving to the next step and level with yourself and with your career, you know, through, through pushing open those barriers is what helps you get to whatever that qualification is. Yes. And it sounds like those are the sorts of characteristics that will also be important uh, for people living on the moon or Mars, being able to deal with the anxiety there, the anxiety, of course, of living in an environment that's uh, instantaneously lethal, really, outside your yep. habitat. So the characteristics that perhaps you need even to be successful in contributing to this on Earth will be the same sorts of characteristics you'll need uh, on the Moon and Mars. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Dolly. And I'm going to end off with one last question. If you got a phone call from NASA tomorrow saying, there's a secret <laughs> rocket it's going to Mars next week, and we want you to go to Mars, would you go to Mars? Next week? No. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you need? Um, I want to be here right now because we're in a really incredibly hard moment for humanity and I have to be here to help. Um, but, you know, we get out oh, on yeah, the other okay. side. Well, well, pandemic, so that's what I'm being, I'm being <laughs> pandemic because... aside, if this was normal times, uh, would you go to Mars? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so long as I can come back. Okay. Well, that's, that's good to know because of course there are people who have, signed up right for these one-way trips to Mars um, and they maybe have uh, a slightly different perspective from most people so no, you'd I, want to come back. I only I only like the pause and you can't see of course because we've shut up my video but like I'm pausing because I have lots of thoughts that are running through my head which um, I, I, like go into my answer yes of course I would get on if, if all things were you know if this was a while ago and or you know maybe a few years in the in the future Yes, I would go. But there are, I want to come home. And there are lots of other things that um, I would have to add to my answer, which we can do mm. another time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Thank you very much, Dolly, for joining me. It's great to hear about, um, you know, your career and your uh, huge and very diverse contributions to lunar and Mars exploration. And I guess we all hope that um, humans will be landing on the moon and eventually Mars uh, sometime soon to, to make use of all this knowledge that you've gained on, on human exploration. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure. <laughs>